So it's time to call Bart Bibuk from Brussels at the FEHGU. Hello, Bart. Hello. Hello. Nice You're the great to be here. Director from the FEHGU, which stands for Fuel Cell and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking. First, can you explain what is this organization and how it can help for hydrogen deployment? Well, the Fuel Cells and Hydrogen Joint Undertaking is basically a public-private partnership. So we have uh, three partners uh, with whom we work. Uh, it's first of all a public site, which is European Commission, which is of course very important because they put the money on the table then, which we can then uh, support uh, financially uh, projects. Um, and the other two partners are basically private partners. It's Hygiene Europe Industry, 250 um, uh, industrial um, organizations. And then uh, we have uh, Hygiene Europe Research is around uh, 80 uh, research organizations. Basically, what we are doing is uh, we supporting uh, financially uh, projects in the research field, of course, of fuel cells and hydrogen. By today, we have funded uh, 285 projects uh, for around 1.07 billion euro. And since this is a public-private partnership, of course, it's uh, also the private members uh, needs to put in equal amount of money. Uh, we work in energy field, transport field, and uh, the cross-cutting field is more a bit of a horizontal issues around standardization, safety, and education. So how can we help to, of course, uh, to accelerate the, the famous hydrogen economy we are all talking about? Is basically, well, when we support uh, R&I, the idea is to accelerate the actually the development uh, of those technologies. Uh, you know that still uh, several technologies are expensive, so we need to do the cost reduction. Also, we need to help uh, to uh, scale up the manufacturing. So we also look into uh, technologies, how we can uh, manufacture uh, faster uh, and, 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 and with a good quality, of course. Uh, but also we do demonstration uh, projects. And so we have a couple of uh, big demonstration projects where we put uh, a fleet of cars, a fleet of buses uh, in the field. Uh, and we also provide the infrastructure and we test it. Uh, to, to show, to demonstrate that it works, because this is the way how you can convince them later uh, uh, people who wants to buy this kind of technology that you really show, look, it works, you know, and, and without any problem. Maybe to start, we can discuss uh, the Jive and Jive 2 program because it's about uh, buses and it works very well. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, the Jive and the Jive 1 was actually uh, one of our latest uh, projects on buses where we really want to put hundreds of buses uh, in the field actually to be exact that's around 256 buses but before that before we arrived at, at this point of course we had uh, smaller projects uh, really started on more than 10 years ago i mean i remember at that time the first bus uh, in the in the chic project was uh, 1.8 million euro of course at that time nobody wants to buy such kind of bus but we need to do, to show it that it I mean that the technology works and we have done several projects in between and, and, and each time we reduce the cost of the bus and now with Jive, Jive 2 we reached basically a, a cost of around 500,000 euro for a bus and we know now that um, when cities will order now hundreds of buses as a next step that we can get even below the 500,000 euro and actually being competitive at uh, other uh, zero emission technologies. So what we actually did is coming from a very early uh, research stage to bring it to basically a commercial uh, position now. And uh, for us, for us, buses is now uh, completely commercial. And, and it's, it's great to see because we have, I, I said, the city of Essen, for example, recently in, in uh, Germany, they ordered uh, 100 uh, hydrogen buses. I know from another city, 200 hydrogen buses. So you see that basically now, now it's gone. Huh? For us now and the buses, of course, we need to look now to coaches and that's something new. The challenge in coaches is uh, very different than city buses, what we have done so far. Okay, one word about uh, cars and stations through the HME program. Yeah, the H2ME pro uh, program is really um, uh, an activity where we try to coordinate in Europe among several countries uh, where to position uh, the hydrogen refueling stations and also to put at the same time a number of cars uh, at those stations so that basically the station can be used in, in, in a sustainable way. So in that project, we put it to 50 uh, stations, uh, 50 hydrogen refueling stations in various countries, being in, in countries really up to the north, like uh, in, in Norway, but also in as well as Scandinavia, but also in Iceland. So very harsh conditions, very cold, see how it works. 
but also in, in France, in Germany, UK. So we, we really wanted to test several environmental uh, conditions, but also various business cases, huh? because each country has different uh, taxation schemes for cars or, when, or, or even for fuels. So what we did was really also putting around those uh, stations a number of cars, and totally we will fund uh, 1,400 uh, cars uh, for all those stations. And a big part of those cars are range extenders. And so that means you have basically a battery car where you put a, a small fuel cell in addition. Uh, and, and so that basically those uh, vehicles, which are basically vans and, and, and current form, that can drive longer than only with battery. And we see that there is a business case as well for that. But we wanted to learn from that. How are people using those type of cars? And I think it was very successfully because that led now, I mean, I, I think you know, you know it, uh, Stellantis announced very recently uh, the Opel and, and, and Peugeot and, and Citroën, now they will come with this type of uh, vehicle. And I think, again, our program or our, this project really demonstrated that is a viable solution and a solution that people want. And so then you see, again, the uptake and to go to commercialization. So FAA Geo has been a starter. And another key application is for fleets of taxis, and you've been supporting the Zephyr program. Yeah, the Zephyr program and also uh, earlier as well, uh, other projects. But uh, what we wanted to do is really um, to support taxi fleets. And so why taxi fleets is because we see that hydrogen will play a very important role in the passenger car, especially when the vehicles are used in a high intensive use. And uh, high intensive use, well, clearly a taxi is uh, as intensive use. So, and we see that, for example, in Paris, the, the hype taxis that uh, I'm sure you, you, you know about them, uh, we, we have really supported them. We saw that this was a, a good model uh, because there's a lot of take uh, off of the hydrogen. And so now we wanted to replicate uh, what we have done, tried first in, in Paris, now in other parts of, of Europe. Uh, like in the UK, uh, also we, we try to do something similar in Brussels. Uh, we will go also probably to Copenhagen. So you see other capitals in Europe are now actually copying something that was really kickstarted in Paris in an earlier project. So the Zephyr project is about basically uh, try the same uh, model in other uh, capitals. So the next step and maybe the next uh, success is about uh, trucks, H2 trucks with the H2 hole. Yeah, so exactly. Exactly. Basically, what we want to try to do is to replicate what we did with the buses, uh, really starting from uh, yeah, very basic and then try to reduce the cost and, until you can go then to uh, I mean, commercialization. So we just started, actually. I mean, H2O was the first project where we really wanted to demonstrate uh, 15 trucks uh, really in the field. Uh, I think it's in, in, in four different countries that we will try them uh, with two uh, manufacturers. Uh, one is uh, Iveco, the other one is VDL. Uh, with two European fuel cell uh, stack providers as well. So it's really a European project. And uh, yeah, the idea is that they put, they built now the first trucks, put it on the road and test them with real customers. Uh, one customer will be, for example, BMW in Germany, will really test them in their uh, uh, facilities. So yeah, I'm looking forward really, or also Carrefour in France, by the way, will also use uh, those trucks. So I'm looking forward to see the results, but of course, Push. This is not where it will end. Huh? The next step is really to to have these bigger fleets of demonstrations like we had uh, with the Jive buses. I believe that this should be our next step. Thank you, Bob Bibuk, for being with us today. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay, as you have guessed, uh, we had to record earlier uh, this interview because uh, Bart was not available. He had a meeting at the same time, but thanks again for him to be uh, with us. Uh, okay, I would like now to ask a question to Pierre-Etienne Franc. Uh, Pierre-Etienne, you were a former exec from Air Liquide and you were the General Secretary from the Hydrogen Council. We will uh, discuss uh, your new occupation uh, in a few minutes, but first maybe a comment about uh, heavy-duty mobility. We can see that Hydrogen is arriving uh, in buses, but also on trucks. Well, I think we have a, we have a, an interesting dynamic in Europe, but we should not forget what's going on in the rest of the world, huh? because uh, honestly, uh, we, all, we often say that uh, the beauty of Europe is that we get a very good uh, vision on strategic thinking, but it's sometimes more difficult to implement, and it's true that. Uh, in the last 10 years, thanks to the FCH GU, which I know very well because uh, I was in charge uh, a couple of years ago to manage it, uh, 
with BART, um, we have hundreds of buses on a couple of trucks, but in China, in three years, they have achieved, I think, uh, more than five or 6,000 trucks on buses which are running uh, uh, every day. Uh, the trucks are not heavy duty trucks, it's more, uh, I would say, uh, medium duty vehicles to do uh, the urban deliveries. Uh, the buses are uh, numerous and they continue to increase their dynamic there. I think Korea has also catched up very significantly over the last uh, two years with a massive development of uh, infrastructure and uh, start of big deployments of, uh, of buses. Hyundai is leading the show on uh, heavy duty trucks with, uh, I think, this time uh, Switzerland as the biggest field for implementation, but maybe some uh, around the table know better than me. So it's true that heavy duty mobility is probably the next frontier for us. But we need to make sure that uh, Europe is uh, working the talk rapidly, putting in place rapidly the, the incentives to enable those uh, projects to come on stream. And we need not only, of course, the support for the OEMs to move, but we need to find a way to revive or, or re, um, re-accelerate the notion of PPPs or things like that to enable the infrastructure to be partly financed. Because the big trouble remains this uh, loading factor for the infrastructure. But maybe the last uh, element is that um, the heavy duty truck is uh, facing a, a small, um, I would say, topic, which is what's going to be the end game in terms of a uh, type of delivery of hydrogen. Is it going to be uh, 350 bar? Is it going to be 700 bar? Or is it going to be liquid? And we need to be careful there because if we change too fast uh, from one techno to another, we are basically uh, impairing uh, significant uh, investment done by the industry uh, up front. And uh, sometimes the le mieux est l'ennemi du bien, as we say in French. So uh, uh, high pressure is maybe less good in terms of autonomy than liquid storage, but uh, it has some advantages is that we know it, we've mastered it, we've developed it, we have a start of the stations. Uh, the U.S. is developing uh, mostly uh, high-pressure-based uh, trucks. Uh, uh, they have different uh, ways of um, uh, loading the, the, the trucks with more space for the reservoirs so because they are, the roads are bigger, the space is larger globally in the U.S. But I think we should be careful before sh- going too fast into the liquid-based reservoir, even though it has some interest. So yes, promising, critical, because we need heavy duty to load faster the stations, but we should not uh, forget too fast uh, the light duty, uh, heavy intensive mobility uh, solution like commercial vehicles that are now, uh, I think the Stellantis and others are pushing for, the taxi fleet, which, uh, as you know, have been uh, sponsoring for uh, the last uh, couple of years uh, with the Picardy, uh, is also a very nice example of a, a significant uh, uh, chicken or egg dilemma solution, I would say. Thank you, uh, Pierre Etienne, for this uh, first uh, statement. I would like now to uh, uh, turn the floor to Patrick Knobben. So you're based in uh, Netherlands, in Groningen. Uh, we will discuss later on what is a new energy for co- new coalition for energy, of course. Uh, mm-hmm. I would like to ask you a question about um, what's going on with trucks in Rotterdam, because uh, there is a, a project to have a, a huge fleet of trucks. Yes. Well, good morning, and thank you for the organization to uh, invite me. Sorry, I'm squeezing around my, my camera. Um, yes, um, uh, looking at Rotterdam, uh, there is a very big project initiated uh, by Air Liquide to um, bring to, let's say, the market, so to say, uh, 1,000 trucks. The project is called High Truck. And uh, I think it's a very, very interesting project because it intends to, let's say, facilitate the market with with a lot of vehicles which which is of course let's say a, a not not a cakewalk it's it's a difficult project because first you have to have the trucks and then you have to take them into operation and you need to have commercial parties let's say driving around with with the trucks um but this project is about thousands so uh, initiated and uh, let's say care, uh, managed by by Elikide. the three uh, the uh, key harbors in that project are port of rotterdam Port of Duisburg in in North Rhine-Westphalia. Duisburg is the biggest inland port in Europe, and uh, Antwerp is connected. Um, and there are, let's say, a a a, a vast number of European OEMs. Some uh, truck manufacturers are involved. I cannot name them all, 
because otherwise I would, uh, let's say, uh, risk uh, forgetting someone, uh, and I don't want to do that. But it's very, very interesting, and there is a website which which also gives some more insights. And um, um, so I think it, this is a game-changing uh, project because it's 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 so big, it's fast, and it connects, let's say, ports to ports, uh, not only. The, let's say the, the waterway transport, but of course the, the 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 road transport with the heavy trucks of let's say the 40 ton uh, uh, container trucks, and it cons comprises actually that 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 route of the com containers, but also the trucks which go inside into the cities, like the food trucks, to uh, let's say um, support or uh, provide let's say the groceries to the the supermarkets. Uh, uh, let's say we, we have one in the Netherlands called Albert Heijn uh, or Albert Heijn de Leze, Ahol de Leze. Of course, uh, you've got several others in, in, in Europe, uh, amongst which uh, Bart mentioned. So um, I think this is a very exemplary project which in which the industry takes the takes up the challenge. And it's, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. And we really would like to support that from our region because we are not, let's say, uh, included in the Rotterdam region. But... The Netherlands is a quite a small country, so we need to work together. And uh, and actually, that's 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 the basis of hygiene. If you cannot share, you cannot multiply. This is something we need to do together. Thank you. Uh, one question for François Gongsi. So you are part of the EDF group. So it's an electricity provider. Uh, what is the strategy uh, in order to decarbonize heavy duty mobility? <clears throat> Hello, Laurent. Hello, everybody. That first, that's a pleasure to to be among such a good company today. So, uh, thank you to invite me, uh, and I'm happy to participate. So, as, as you mentioned, I'm uh, in charge of customer activities for the Dev Group in the east of France. That means that, well, to, to answer in in one sentence uh, to your question, as you know, we are uh, the, the I would say low carbon energy company. So. If I had to answer in one question to to you in, in one sentence to your question is that we we do provide the energy usually the electricity and the solution to make it happen. That means decarbonize the heavy duty transport. You need a really low carbon or green electricity first and the solution to transform it uh, to uh, to mobility. More precisely then. <clears throat> Let's let's say uh, let take the example of uh, of one of my clients. <laughs> um, in France today, uh, most of the projects to decarbonize heavy duty transport comes from uh, public authorities, usually munis municipalities, as uh, mentioned by your your first uh, your first guests on the beginning of uh, the session, uh, mainly from buses. That's the first question usually. So they come to us saying, let's say, tell me some advices, examples, uh, uh, analysis to 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 decarbonize my buses, my trucks, and so on. So usually we compare. This is our job. We compare solution with electricity first, electrical uh, buses uh, against hydrogen. Sometimes, uh, let's say, we are not. Uh, technological driven, we compare both and we provide solution for both. So as today is for uh, is a webinar about uh, hydrogen, for hydrogen, when the client finally opts for a hydrogen solution, hydrogen buses, trucks, and so on, uh, we mainly, in the value chain, we mainly provide upstream and midstream solutions to uh, bring the, the low carbon uh, hydrogen or green hydrogen to very next to the consumers. We do that through a subsidiary, which is uh, Hynamix, uh, able to build, operate and maintain its own electrolyzers or to provide services uh, of uh, operating and maintenance to electrolyzer belonging to our, to our clients. That's the first thing. And the second thing, for uh, persons, let's say, knowing perfectly how to provide and, and produce uh, the, the hydrogen, we also provide the, the green electricity or the decarbonized electricity, maybe we will talk about that later, uh, uh, to, to have a low carbon uh, 
uh, hydrogen at competitive cost. And last, uh, since now, for I think uh, for four years, five years you know, even, um, we are also um, uh, the reference shareholder of McPhee, which is an electrolyzer manufacturer in France, in, uh, important uh, electrolyzer manufacturer, and we are we are happy to work to, together with our uh, research and development and with them as an industrial to let's say as your webinar is about scaling up uh, hydrogen to provide uh, very big industrial solutions for everybody. Thank you. Thierry Lepert, can you comment on uh, heavy-duty mobility uh, deployment? Sure. Can you, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, we have to start from the customers. <laughs> Who is buying uh, those, um, those, uh, uh, those systems, those buses, those, uh, those trucks? And, uh, and the trucking industry is extremely price sensitive. Um, it's a very low margin business. Uh, they don't care about saving the planet. They, they, they uh, care about surviving, surviving as companies because they have very, very thin margin. The minute you offer them a system that reduces their TCO, the total cost of ownership of their trucks, uh, they move. But until then, nobody moves. So it's a very complex situation. It's a binary situation. Either you have something, and that has to be a system. So you need, for instance, the trucks, you need the uh, 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 charging stations, you need the fueling stations, you need the, um, the hydrant itself, you need the financing. All of this needs to come together and make it a very attractive prop a proposition to, uh, for hundreds of thousands of trucks. Because if you don't get there, you don't have the volumes. So it's a circle. You know, it's a chicken and egg situation. Where do you get the volumes? Because you have the cost. Where do you get the cost? Because you have the volumes. And uh, the solution from that is not simple. It's not simple. It, it has to be done at the same time. Everyone needs to come together. And, and, uh, and there again, the uh, uh, manufacturers will, will not ramp up massively their, their, uh, uh, their capacity. They know the Hyzons, the Hyundai, the, uh, the Toyotas of the world will not ramp up their capacity unless uh, they have the comfort that customers are going to rush in, into buying their product. And, uh, and, and the same thing goes with infrastructures. Infrastructures need to be in place for fueling stations, and most importantly, the product itself. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, there is a very, very direct connection between mobility and the price of the product, because it, in the TCO of, uh, uh, of a truck, fuel is uh, around 70 percent. 70 percent is the fuel cost. So if you have a fuel cost at five euros per kilogram, forget it. It will never happen. Uh, if you have a fuel cost delivered to uh, at the pump level at 2.5 uh, pre-tax, then you're switching. You know that's the that's the tipping point. 2.5 euros. And you've asked to uh, the, those those. Uh, uh, those truck uh, operators, they're saying 2.5, I will switch, uh, provided obviously I'll have the, 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 the right price. Uh, but unless it's 2.5, I won't get there. Now, 2.5 has to include the fueling stations. So that means that unless you have a, a, a hydrogen delivered in very, very large quantities at 1.5, then you don't get it. So there again, uh, the message here, it's a systems approach. Uh, uh, it, it's not just one project here, one project. It has to be seen as a systemic uh, way. And by the way, same thing for the deployment of refueling stations. If you have a few refueling stations, it won't work. You need to have a densely, uh, a dense, uh, uh, an operational uh, uh, system, pan-European system of uh, thousands of, of fueling stations if you want this system to work. So there again, the step is very high. Uh, and the question is, can we uh, overcome that in the next five years? My personal conviction is that it will happen. But there again, let's look at the systemic approach. Thank you. Uh, a quick question for Patrick Nubin, because I can see a nice picture uh, behind you. It's a Normandy boat, a Normandy vessel. So are you convinced that uh, hydrogen can be applied for boats as well? 
Um, yes, and I think in principle, Hajin uh, can offer uh, solutions for, for all applications of, let's say, oil-based liquid fuels, although these kinds of objects are quite, let's say, um, a, a challenge because they are very big and uh, you need to have vast quantities of hydrogen available, probably in a the, in the liquid, liquid or a liquidized form. But, uh, but I would also like to re re reflect to Mrs. Mr. Lepec's remark. I fully agree that it needs to be, the cost needs to be as low as possible, uh, probably less than two and a half euros per kilogram pre-tax. And maybe looking at the pre-tax uh, domain, I think it would be very wise for Europe to harmonize tax on fuels. And maybe we should also, if it's a bit off cue, ask for a full and endured exemption for hydrogen as a fuel for trucks. Uh, we need to pull all the strings together to do that. And in, for instance, in, in maritime fuels, they are free of uh, uh, levies or duties. So why not? in the first, let's say, 10 years, have a full exemption for hydrogen as a fuel all over Europe. So no, let's say, uh, discrepancies between countries, because it makes no sense if one country has a, has a taxation and uh, one meter across the border is no taxation. That is in the level playing field. So I, I do very much agree on Mr. Lepag. It's a systemic approach, not only from the technology, but also from the financial aspects. Okay, uh, so we're going now to turn the floor to uh, Bruno Jamais from the Vehicle of the Future cluster. Do we have any questions, Bruno? Yes, uh, we have two questions. The first is for Pierre Etienne Franc. Uh, uh, someone would like to uh, to detail uh, his vision on the use cases for liquid or pressurized hydrogen in mobility. My the use case well this in fact there's no it's not very different than uh, gaseous uh, storage it's, uh, and I think that's exactly the point that Thierry made is that uh, the issue is not really the technologies the 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 customer experience so with liquid uh, you might load the vehicles a little bit faster than with high pressure gas. And normally with liquid, you have a better density. So you're going to store more energy in the same volume. So you will increase the autonomy probably by a few hundred more kilometers. So you're making the heavy, the long distance heavy duty truck easier to develop because you don't need to stop every 500 kilometers, even though the truck drivers usually should stop every 500 kilometers because he has to make his rest. Uh, but it changes also the dynamic of the station infrastructure to build up. You might need less stations. The topic being, however, that the cost of those stations, liquid, very heavy liquid stations, might not be so much cheaper than uh, the cost of gas stations because you've got a couple of technical constraints. So autonomy better, time to refuel maybe a little bit better, but cost of the hydrogen, which is one of the big, uh, I, need, I know, uh, like that here is pushing to get the price of hydrogen at level which is very, very, very aggressive. <laughs> so it might not improve so much the cost of hydrogen because of some of the techni technical constraints. So there is a debate in, in turn between the, the OEM world, between, uh, I would say, basically Daimler is pushing that very strongly because they believe it's the right solution. Other truck OEMs are more uh, silentious or even against. So we are, I am not a truck expert, so I'm not going to say what should be the, the, the one, but it's true that liquid is bringing benefits, but I'm not sure it's so easy to manage in terms of infrastructure. Okay, Bruno, second question. Lots of questions. The next one is for Thierry Leperc concerning the pragmatic approach concerning TCO. How do you see the influence of cost-free measures like regulations? Um, Getting something about taxes, you know, you could say I, I want uh, tax-free uh, tax hydrogen, that's sure. Now, if you go to governments and say, you know what, uh, we're going to replace diesel, which is heavily uh, a big source of income, with uh, hydrogen, which is no source of income, who's going to make it up for the loss? And, and we all know that diesel and other, uh, and, 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 and other things are, are very important. So we're all stuck. You know, it's, hydrogen is very small. 
So the loss of revenue is small, it's okay. But the problem is that if it's small, <laughs> you don't get the volumes, you don't get the cost. So, so the only way it can work is that if every trucking company wants to go hydrogen, Europe, every single one, because it makes sense. It makes sense from an economic standpoint. And if it remains small, then it does work. So, so that's where regulation from that standpoint, in my opinion, has to stand out of the way and make it possible for market players to, uh, to, to work. And, and for me, the collaboration that we need to have is a collaboration between industry. Who needs to be involved? We need to have, uh, uh, obviously, the hydrogen generation. We'll talk about it later and, 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 and transmission to bring the product. Uh, we need the, uh, uh, I was having this conversation with HRS a couple of days ago. We need a mass scale deployment of refueling stations in strategic areas. Is it, uh, and for instance, in logistics platforms, we're talking to logistics platforms companies. There's a very, very strong case to put all these refueling stations where the trucks come. And, 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 and then you, but you need to have the right level of things and it has to be coordinated. Should that be coordinated by government? Maybe. I think ultimately it's a value chain players who need to get together and work on it. And then the next question is, how do you get the uh, volumes of trucks? And, and we're talking here about fleets. So there is a special role in my opinion for a large trucking company that should go, uh, you know, one of those major trucking companies uh, or a few of them or organized should go and, and see, for instance, both the, uh, uh, the, the truck suppliers and, and, and the uh, refueling station suppliers say, we are going big. We want hundreds of thousands of your trucks. We're going to aggregate demand. And this is for me far more powerful when it's uh, an industry which does it. Also, what we need, by the way, is the support of financial institutions because all these trucks will need financing. So you need to have the leasing companies involved. So this is far more an industry organization than a government-driven thing. And I'm not sure that government is the best, uh, uh, I mean, the, the best people to run a trucking company. Uh, uh, trucking companies are not run by government. I mean, this idea that you have government or government officials who know hardly anything about trucking uh, being involved in that is wrong. So that puts the onus, the responsibility on industry, which needs to get together, not just in conferences and saying things about, you know, we're going to save the planet. No, 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 no. Volumes, getting back volumes, orders, uh, uh, infrastructure deployment. That's the weight is on industry, in my opinion. Mm -hmm.